OK, so since the audience is getting kind of shrinked, I guess you are now the core IoT enthusiast. Uh, <laughs> so we can have a proper discussion. So I'll, uh, I won't go through all these uh, protocols and all the stuff, and because uh, all the people before me, they spoke about that a lot. And uh, what I'll try to do is uh, to explain how we, get, how we got into this uh, whole uh, IoT domain and uh, to give you some examples of uh, what we have done with IoT technology. And uh, also at the end, if we have time uh, to talk about uh, a project that we have ongoing at the moment. So I'm uh, one of the founders of the Dunavnet company. We are based in Novi Sad, have a kind of office in Ireland as well. And we started to work in the IoT domain back in 2008. So those 2007 award that was for my uh, mobile communication work, although I just uh, seen some of the patterns that I did are now being implemented by Ericsson. So that, that's a cool thing. Uh, I started to work in uh, uh, 2007. I was writing my first proposal for IoT project. It wasn't called IoT back then. It was wireless sensor networks, machine to machine, and so on. And then uh, it was one of these uh, FP7, Framework Program 7 projects. Uh, th there was uh, also a couple of other companies with Ericsson, Alcatel, Lucent, Nokia, Telefonica, some big guys, universities. And that was the first uh, project, European project, that was uh, going into the direction of IoT. And in that project, we created foundation for IoT as it is uh, known today in Europe. So we created the first architectures, the initial stuff. Uh, we started to work on some of the protocols, and then later on, we created also the community out of that. And uh, mo today, community in IoT, European at least, community in IoT, it's, uh, it has the roots in that particular project. And it helped a lot, of course, to get to know the people, to people get to know you. And it helped, in, helped me in getting involved in a number of other IoT projects. So over the years, I was probably in some 20 or so different EU projects. Uh, we were doing all sorts of things uh, from very early protocol creation, architecture def definition, and then also some of the pilots. One of the most interesting pilots that I was involved in was in uh, Santander, which is a city in Spain, north of Spain. As I usually say, lovely beaches, uh, lousy weather. That's the problem, but uh, it's a city of maybe two, three hundred thousand people. And what we did over a three years project is that, uh, and that we are talking about 2012, I think, 2012, 2013. We deployed something over 10,000 different sensors in the city. And uh, we did uh, create a platform, we de deployed the sensors, and then we created some services on top of that. And that was before Raspberry Pi, that was before Arduinos, all the nice things that we have today. So it was a bit uh, more difficult to do it back then, at least uh, hardware-wise. It was also before all these IoT platforms that are available today. So we had to build a lot ourselves. Anyway, it was a great uh, learning curve, and uh, we managed to learn a lot about what does it mean to go into the wild like cities and uh, streets and do some installation there because it's completely different from installing a software on somebody's uh, PC. Anyway, out of all these different uh, projects uh, that we did uh, over the years that were mainly research innovation projects, we started to build as a company our own solutions. And uh, two main domains that uh, we're addressing are smart city and smart agriculture. We started with the cities and still have some activities there, but agriculture is now more of interest. You know, the cities, uh, it means public administration. And public administration is the same everywhere. It's uh, very slow, very difficult, uh, very, uh, I don't know what word to use, uh, very complicated to work in that, uh, typical, that environment. You have to know how to handle that. So we focus more on agriculture. And also, the other thing is that in agriculture, the business case is much more clear. Because in the cities, when you say, okay, we have uh, air quality monitoring. And when I spoke about that for the first time, it was 2009 or 2010, I was in Belgrade uh, talking to environmental protection agency there, 10 people, and I presenting, okay, so we'll put these uh, air quality monitoring devices on public buses, we let the buses go around the city, so we get a mobile network, mobile air quality network. And I was really excited about this and talking, oh, look, we'll do this, we'll do that, and, blah, blah, blah. and then one of the ladies stood up and said, okay, who was the fool to think about something like this? This is complete nonsense. I was saying, okay, me? No? And eventually, okay, we managed to go over it, and uh, I, did, I was back in Ericsson th at that stage. And that solution was, uh, in a sh it was shortlisted for an award at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona a year later for, I don't know, transport domain or something. 
And nowadays, so this was 2010, now we are getting customers for that. And we get customers in Poland, we have Novi Sad as a customer, and few other, we have also in uh, Vielina some installations. And that's because uh, now people are realizing, okay, there is some problem with air quality. We have to do something about that. And the high quality, reliable measurement station costs like 100,000 euro and calibration costs 10,000 euros. So we can afford only one or two, or depending on the size of the city, a few more. But these smaller devices, we can do much more. We get lower quality measurements than that, but not a lot. But we can do it on a much larger scale. So it takes time. Uh, this is the portfolio of the solutions that we have built over the years. And we did use uh, different IoT platforms. Uh, we started with some open source. We started with our own stuff. At some point in time, we wanted to build our own platform, IoT platform. And then eventually, we gave up on that. Uh, Nowadays, we are working solely on Microsoft Azure. Uh, first time I tried to do this, uh, it was maybe three or four years ago, and we said, no, it's not good enough. What we had as an open source was uh, better. Two years ago, we went back to that again, and since then, we moved, we ported all our solutions to Microsoft Azure, and I really consider that as uh, one of the best uh, IoT platforms. Uh, so we have a... Two sets of city, CityNet is our uh, set of uh, smart city solutions. AgroNet is for agriculture. And what we just started recently is uh, what I call factory net is uh, in the direction of smart uh, manufacturing. So one important thing that was mentioned a few times, uh, guys from Tele2 was talking about ecosystem, and I think there were a few other times that was mentioned. Ecosystem is one of the most important things in IoT. If you want to succeed, you have to be part of an ecosystem. If you try to get it on your own, you're doomed to fail. For sure. I was sitting in Brussels in a meeting. There was some, by invitation, only 40, 50 companies invited from Europe. So I was lucky to be there. And the CTO of IBM actually was uh, one of the CTOs, I guess, of uh, IBM was there. That was two, three years ago. And he said, OK, look, we are IBM. No, we can. We are big, we can do whatever we want, but for IoT, we have to partner with different uh, organizations. So if IBM has to do, all of you, including me, have to do the same. So really, it's really, really important to understand that and to try to build your business case around that. So from our perspective, how we are approaching this is that we have partners, and the partners are our hardware providers, so companies like uh, ByteLab, although we they are not our partner at the moment, but that's the type of a company that we can partner with who will provide hardware. We partner with, uh, IoT, with Microsoft, in this case, for uh, IoT platform. We also partner with domain experts because uh, IoT covers a large set of different uh, technologies or different domains, so you can't know everything about everything. So you have to know somebody who knows how those plants are growing or how that traffic is being managed. And at the end, we also work with system integrators because IoT, okay, it's cloud solution, but not everything is cloud. At the end, there is a sensor or a number of sensors that you have to plug in somewhere. And I can't do it. I can't plug a sensor in Sarajevo from Novi Sad. I mean, a bit difficult at the moment. So you have to have local partners. And we are actively looking and creating these partnerships with local partners in different uh, markets who can work with us. So they will take installation, they will take configuration, they will take contract with the end user, they will do local support. We won't go into that, and that's their part of the pie, of the cake. We, do, we license our software, we provide it on the cloud, we make sure that it's running properly, and relationship with customer is the role of either system integrators or of the service providers who are providing the service. Another, so when it comes to customers, our customers are service providers, so companies providing a service to the end users, but also software developers in some cases, especially for agriculture. In agriculture, what we are trying to do is to wrap up a lot of agriculture expertise into different modules, put an API on top of that, and then allow software developers to build their own software application, their own services for smart agriculture on top of our own APIs. So we don't have to build even the complete software, so all the GUI and the stuff. You, everybody can do that. But not everyone can actually capture that agricultural expertise. But if you take this parameter, that parameter, and that parameter, what will happen with the plant? What should you do? So giving those advices, that's something that you require strong domain expertise. And that's what we are providing. And then software developers can 
don't have to have that. They can know Java, .NET, whatever, and build the application. And then end users are all the agriculture companies, public administration, enterprises, depending on really on the application. And uh, this is uh, the most technical slide that I will have today. So we have, I think this is pretty much in, in line with what you see, what you saw today. So there are devices, there are some gateways. In most of the cases at the moment, we use a mobile network as the communication part, although we do have some uh, LoRa stuff. It goes to IoT Hub as the central component of uh, Microsoft Azure. And then there are some uh, databases, uh, data analytics, machine learning, whatever is used, and uh, web and mobile application at the end. So this is rather kind of simple if you look at this way. And, but uh, somebody said that you, you don't have to have a platform. Yes, in principle, you don't have to have a platform. But every time you want to build another application without having a platform, it will take you a lot of time. I can, because we use Microsoft Azure, we get a set of common components. Then we have built our own set of components on top of that. So we didn't have a solution for uh, parking management, outdoor parking management. We didn't have it. And then uh, we got a request from uh, one of the clients, okay, can we have it? We, we need it. H how long would you take to build something like that? What do you think? Yeah, we did it in uh, six weeks. In six weeks or eight weeks, uh, they already had uh, everything there in place. But the only reason why we were able to do that is because we were able to reuse loads of stuff here and basically to build only the web application there at the back. Of course, not everything is possible to do it that way because sometimes you have a very complex uh, application logic. You have to do a lot of uh, analysis, so that will require time. But for simple connecting sensor, providing some visualization, some simple reporting, that can be done really quickly if you use platform. It doesn't have to be Azure, it can be any IoT platform. But my recommendation would be go for a platform. Another recommendation for startups, don't build a platform. That game has gone. Three months ago when we were doing a count, there were 365 IoT platforms in the world. So you don't want to be 366th or 67th platform. Hmm? Yeah, exactly, yes. So uh, my recommendation would be don't bother with that. Go after something else in that space. Okay, so the title of the presentation was From Potatoes to Beer, IoT is Everywhere. And uh, there was a commercial, I don't know if it was broadcasted here, uh, for uh, one of the spreads, uh, Vital. Uh, it was about, uh, who knows, okay, Thomas is the only one who doesn't understand me when I'm not speaking in English, yeah. So there was... A, uh, reklama je bila za Vitalovo, kaže, u sve se miješa. So, it's the same thing uh, here. IoT, it's now finding its place uh, everywhere. So, potatoes, we started with, uh, op we actually started with sugar beet, but then we also expanded to potato and uh, corn, soybean, and uh, whatever other uh, vegetables uh, and crops. So, monitoring uh, how irrigation is done and how to optimize that, how to reduce the amount of water. By reducing the amount of water, you're reducing the amount of electricity or fuel that you are using. But by optimizing the amount of water that you give to the crops, you give them optimal conditions to grow. So you can increase actually the yields and the quality, and eventually you increase the profit. And those are the small things that are not so small things that you have to do, but it's not really just straightforward. You can't just plug in the sensor, say, okay, soil moisture is that much, and what now? You need agricultural expertise. You need to know what, what is the plant. Uh, you need to know how much water that plant needs at a particular vegetation period. And then you have to, you can give uh, some sort of advice. Then you also have to take into account the irrigation system. Because some irrigation systems are those uh, drip systems, no, like uh, drop by drop. Okay, you switch it on and the complete field is flooded immediately. But you have some of these other, especially in the larger fields, you have to move, it's a complete machinery, and it takes like a week from this end to that end. And if you tell him, okay, now you have to be irrigating, it will be a week later that he will be actually providing water to the end. So you have to take that into account as well. And these are all different small things that you have to take into account. You get this data analytics, this uh, crystal ball, and then based on that you give advice to the farmer. So if you're after a killer application, don't go for applications that will just show graphs like uh, graphs meaning uh, sensor measurement. Sensor is measuring X, Y, Z, and you are showing X, Y, Z. That's that easy. 
you have to find something which will understand that data, analyze that data, and provide advice, provide guidance, instructions, how to act on that data. Then it's becoming interesting. Uh, next one was apples. So there are butterflies and there are butterflies. There are some nice butterflies and there are not so nice butterflies. These not so nice butterflies are causing problems to apple orchards. And uh, what happens today is that, uh, oops, sorry. So there are uh, these type of uh, kind of a birdhouse. And uh, now I'll switch back to bile su nekad one muholovke kao bisle su zida lepljiva traka pa se muve hvatale na to. So this is the same thing as that, only it's uh, flat, and it has uh, something called pheromone which attracts a particular type of butterfly. So they get attracted and they get glued. And today, farmers have these birdhouses around their orchard, and they go every week, they go around and they count one, two, three, four, five, and the next week they come again. And what happens is that uh, once uh, this uh, number of these butterflies uh, caught gets into saturation, then it's the time to do the treatment. If you do it before that, or if you do it after that, the impact won't be that good. But if you do it at that particular moment, that's the best time because of whatever biology is behind it. So what we did is we added, okay, solar panel, solar panel because of the camera that is inside the house. We take images. Oops, I don't know what this now. Wrong button probably. We take images like this, and then we count them automatically. We count the butterflies automatically. And, uh, okay, counting is, okay, so there is so many, so many, so many, so many. But that's not the only thing. That, then the next step is that we say, okay, the count was like this, like this, like this, like this. And now do this. And use this pesticide, this fungicide, or whatever are the names. That's uh, the thing. Talking about apples, uh, so we are in a, working with the, one of the largest uh, agriculture companies in Serbia. And they have a 400 hectares large apple orchard, which is one of the largest in Europe, at least in one kind of plot. They have, this is the old number, they have over 60,000 of these uh, boxes. Each box is one cubic meter, more or less. You can fit almost half a ton of apples into each of these. And when, it, when the actual uh, harvest starts, they have it all over the place, and they don't have a clue where is which. So they asked us to put some sense into all of that. Okay, so we were adding RFID tags to all of these. Then we were adding RFID gates to 20 or so RFID uh, readers to 20 or so gates so that we can monitor what's happening. But uh, it, in order to install RFID tag on one of these, so you can glue it, but it's not sufficient because they are uh, cleaning it under high water pressure and submerging it. So you have to put additional two screws into it. 60,000 boxes, glue multiplied by two screws, 120,000 screws. It takes time. So it's not easy to do a large installation. It just takes time physically. And it's not that you get these boxes lined up like here and then everybody just there, you sit and then somebody is just putting another one. You have to chase these around the orchard because you are interrupting their process. You have to squeeze into their process, adapt to it, and it really takes a lot of time. And then you get into the scanning process, whether the drivers are driving quicker or, or slower and uh, towards this gate or towards that gate. Loads and loads of problems you have to take care of. Okay, this is interesting. Uh, but uh, anyway, so that's, uh, that's one of the examples. And uh, what we did is uh, we were using a combination of uh, communication protocols. For some of the RFID gates, we were connecting using Wi-Fi. Some of them are connecting using mobile. And some of them we are trying to connect using LoRa as well. Although with LoRa, we still have some issues because of the capacity. So that's something that is still not there, but hopefully it will be there. In, and then uh, what's interesting is how we are adding, combining data. So we are combining now this with fleet management. So we know where the tractors are, where the these, uh, trolleys are, and then we can uh, compare that with the scanning of the each tag or each box. And we can get much richer data and we can get more insights into the whole operation than just by having two separate data sets. And that's one of the other things. Always try to get more data in because the more related data you have, 
the more uh, insights you will be able to get out. Yeah, that's what we, and this is, uh, so we are trying to put all of these uh, agricultural solutions into one suite. Uh, something like, uh, this is a dashboard from our web application. So you get all the different services, you get uh, your installations, whether there are some alerts, and this is a graph of uh, irrigation and how it's uh, done. And there are some other things. So the same way you have Microsoft Office, you can use Word, you can use uh, no PowerPoint on their own, but you can use them also together. So this is the same idea. The farmers, they include, they switch on and off application they need at a particular moment. The more of them they have, the more data will be available, the better results they will be able to get. And uh, eventually what we want to build is like Cortana for agriculture, so that uh, you have a farmer with a mobile phone or tablet, and Cortana will tell him, do it this now, do that now, and uh, that will be it. Of course, I mean, they'll still have to go to the field. I mean, that's something that can't be avoided. Okay, so finally beer. So because I had potatoes to beer, we had apples in the between. So yeah, I, I had to do it for you, Thomas. I mean, that's... Uh, so we were approached recently by a large chemical producer, and they told us about the problem of, uh, you know, each bottle of beer has this uh, sticker saying Sarajevsko or Zaychasko, whatever the beer is. And uh, they wanted us to help them to optimize the amount of glue the adhesive that is used when putting these stickers on the bottles. And so it's grams, why it's matter, because there are, well, matters because there are a lot of, many millions of the bottles, so millions multiplied by grams, it's a lot. The thing was that uh, you have to, uh, if, if you use too, too small amount of glue, the stickers will fall off, and then the brewing company will complain about the quality of the adhesive. If they use too much glue, yes, you won't be able to tear it off, but you'll be using too much glue without any reason. And so we are working now with them. We have a pilot uh, in um, Heineken in Novi Sad. This is dashboard of it, uh, not with real data. And then they're monitoring the current consumption, the average consumption, and they're, they're trying to fit that consumption between some threshold. And then there are also other things like temperature and uh, humidity of the place where they keep adhesive, it uh, affects the temperature of uh, the actual adhesive when it's uh, being applied, it affects. Then we are adding some cameras to see what's happening. And then on top of that, we are able to uh, identify some uh, interruption in the production line as well, which are helping now the actual brewing industry as well. And this is one great example of uh, digital transformation because this chemical company, they want to become uh, providers of a gluing service. They don't want to sell glue per kilo or ton, but they want to provide gluing service, the quality of it. So that's uh, one example of this uh, service economy. And finally, when we are talking about, so we moved into this beer and uh, fast moving consumer goods, and this is the project that I'm uh, coordinating. This is it's one of, from this uh, Horizon 2020 program. And uh, it is about connecting exactly this, fast-moving consumer goods, meaning all the different items that you have on, on the shelves in your shops. Every bottle of milk, every carton of whatever juice, every bottle of beer. Giving identity, identity to each bottle, and giving ability to each bottle to tell you their story. So why it's important? At the moment, yeah, they are just uh, there. And then you have uh, the, what's the name, the barcode. It, it can tell you, okay, it's Coke, it's Cocta, but nothing else, more, not, not more than that. And uh, you want to know what was happening with that uh, bottle, or what was happening with that meat, where it came from. Was it transported in the proper conditions? And that is what the project wants to do, to give voice to these individual items, so they can talk back to you and tell them their story. This is how I was being handled. I was kept in a refrigerator or I was left on the sun. So how we want to do it? Obviously, attaching a Raspberry Pi or Arduino to each bottle of uh, water doesn't make too much sense. It's too costly and it would, be, it would look too weird, to be honest. So we are back to printing technology. So we are using QR codes. And yes, you will say yeah, QR codes, that's all story. It is. But we are using QR codes with magic ink. 
So that's ink that appears or disappears depending on environmental context. Depending on temperature, if temperature goes over a certain threshold that we programmed, the ink will disappear, which means that it will give us a different QR code, which means that we'll be able to detect that that particular item was kept in conditions that were not proper for that particular item. The same thing for the light. So this is uh, that part. And I uh, have here my magic stuff. Let me see. So we have a, this is normal uh, ink, so nothing will change, whatever you do with it. Then you add functional ink, this magic ink, and you get a combination of, you get a new QR code. The, if those red dots are there, you will read one thing. If red dots not are, are not there, you will get another ID. And you'll know, okay, this was the case with this, or it was in another condition, another temperature, another light intensity. And I'll try to, I don't know if this, it won't be possible maybe to see it from there. So this is one of those. And if I do it really properly, it will disappear. I don't know if you see this circle disappeared, believe me. <laughs> and it's actually, I have another version which is uh, calibrated for alcohol, but uh, okay, nowadays uh, I wasn't able to do it. But uh, so, th that's, uh, so it reacts quickly. Of course, this one is coming back so that I can do this exercise multiple times. But uh, for proper application, it will just stay there. It will disappear, and it will disappear forever. We are now having pilots, uh, uh, several pilots. So, okay, so it's a, let's just finish this. So you have these uh, smart tags that are printed. So the cost of it is pretty much the same as cost of printing normal QR code. Uh, we use smartphones, so we use smartphones of all of us. So when I go to shop, I scan it. I get information about the, all the things that are now written in very small letters, the ingredients and the stuff. I get information where it was produced, when was it produced, and the conditions on how it was delivered. The moment I scan that, I share that information also with the retailer, with the farmer or whatever, the manufacturer. So everybody gets information about what was happening with that particular item. So the retailer can give you discount. He tell you, okay, now you are the guy with tall guy, 40 something years, and uh, you are looking into buying a steak. And they will tell you, okay, but by the way, we have some red wine that goes with it. Or it, they will tell, okay, this steak, the, uh, what name, the best before date is tomorrow, you get 10% discount, 20% discount. So you are extending this uh, whole, uh, you're actually enabling creation of whole service economy on top of each individual item that we have around us. Uh, I would finish now. So the consortium is quite big. Uh, we are heading it. Uh, I mean, the budget of, of the complete project is almost 7 million euro. We have uh, companies like Fujitsu, Siemens, a uh, couple of universities, a uh, whole lot of things uh, in the consortium. Uh, we are now doing a pilot with the Univer Export, which is one of the uh, local uh, retail chains. They have a farm, so we'll, tagging, we'll be tagging all the tray of, uh, meat trays and uh, doing the pilot in their shops. And I think th this one I also want to highlight. So we have a budget of 1.2 million euro in the project to give away. To give away to the developers, uh, startups, uh, small companies, well, large companies as well, who will either build some additional components for our platform or our framework, they or who will want to run a pilot based on our services. We just finished one, the first round of calls. We are now evaluating uh, proposals. But uh, end of this year or beginning of next year, we'll have another round, so another half of the amount, more or less. Please do apply. We got 20 proposals, 20 something proposals. We have money for six or seven, which is huge. Well, the, the, the percentage of the probability is so much bigger than in usual horizon calls where you have a probability of maybe 5% at best. So this is a great opportunity if you want to get some money to do some nice things. Please use that. Uh, so just for takeaway, it's important. What we are doing in the company is building a set of IoT, compo IoT services, complete services, hardware, platform, expertise, web applications, mobile applications. 
and we are building them in a way that you can combine them and you can use them either on their own or as interoperable uh, solutions all together. And that power of interoperability and being able to use multiple services jointly and share the data and build knowledge out of the data, that's the best thing of all of this. Thanks. <laughs>